Hello everyone and welcome to today's live session, HIPAA Changes 2019 What's New. And my name is John Christopher. I'm going to be your host today. And uh, now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Mr. Brian L. Turtle, who is our keynote speaker. And also Brian is a certified professional in health ID, certified HIPAA professional, certified business resilience auditor with over 19 years of experience in health ID and compliance consulting. Before I hand the session over to Brian, I would like to tell you that the session is for 90 minutes and you will have a Q&A session at the end of the session for 10 minutes to keep it more interactive and you can ask your questions and you, Brian will be able to answer them. And if there is any questions in between, you can always use the chat window to ask your questions and we will pause for a minute and answer your questions immediately or when Brian is able to answer. And uh, we will mute the attendees to make sure that the, uh, there is no background noise interference in between the sessions so it makes the presenter's voice clear for everyone. And I think Brian can take it over from here now. Thank you very much. Um, again, just a quick background. Uh, my name is obviously Brian Tuttle. I've been doing HIPAA compliance consulting for a long time, really since uh, 2003, back when the uh, HIPAA security rule came out which amended the original 1996 HIPAA privacy rule, adding additional standards and um, regulations relating to electronic protected health information. And obviously, throughout the years, there's been a, a lot of change and morphing um, of this regulation, especially in the area of enforcement, which we'll talk about as we move through this thing. Um, I've personally conducted gosh, probably over five or 600 risk assessments throughout my career for groups of all shapes and sizes, hospitals, small clinics, dental, chiropractor, insurance plans, um, outpatient facilities, you name it, anything on the covered entity side of things, as well as the, uh, the third-party business associates who work with covered entities, um, um, medical billing companies, IT companies, uh, um, medical transcription groups, third-party administrators, uh, all sorts of areas over there, even little little bitty tiny businesses developing, say, an app for an iPhone that need to be vetted for this. So there's, there's not a lot I haven't seen as it relates to how <clears throat> protected health information can be accessed, transmitted, or stored. And, and I've also worked on behalf of the federal government as a contracted auditor on a handful of occasions, nothing I enjoy doing, but I do jump at the opportunity when asked to better ascertain what's myth, what's reality, what what are they looking for versus what we think they're looking for, um, and certainly worked on the other side of that, helping um, covered entities and business associates get through a HIPAA audit. Um, also worked in multiple litigated cases as an expert witness where, and we're going to talk about this because this is a pretty serious aspect of this law, where HIPAA, being a federal law, is now being used in the states under state laws of negligence, invasion of privacy um, for individual remedy, which has definitely made this law a lot more dangerous than it used to be. So without further ado, let's get started here. We've got a lot of slides, and I'll try to wrap this up at the uh, about at uh, 2.20 Eastern. That way you'll have some time for Q&A at the end should you have any. Um, so let's just go back in time for a minute and think historically, because HIPAA historically has really left us alone. Like a lot of federal regulations, there may have been regs on the books, but they weren't really being enforced. So basically we hopped along like this kangaroo aimlessly, not really a problem in the old days, because let's face it, how often did you ever hear of a group being audited or sued or anything like that? Very, very rarely and it really would only happen based upon a fairly large breach or a complaint. Now, that's not the case anymore. We being the kangaroo and the federal government and the trial attorneys being the shark. That's basically where we are today. Um, now, the acronym for HIPAA, and HIPAA is a really robust law. It's like, a, like an octopus. It gets into a lot of different areas of, of uh, laws and regulations, but the whole concept from the beginning of this, and by the way, the law has always been bipartisan, and we'll talk a little bit about politics as well and what we may see or may not see going forward, but Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. 
concept was all about portability of your health insurance from the beginning. That's what this law was primarily meant to do. But what we deal with, when we talk about HIPAA compliance, we're talking about the privacy and security aspects of this, not even in the acronym, but that's our challenge. That's what we face as practice managers and business associates or, or any group dealing with this. When we talk about HIPAA compliance, we're talking about the privacy and security rule. Um, now, one thing I want to point out, this law is frustrating, and it's frustrating because it's very gray. A doesn't equal B. A equals whatever risk dictates it equals. So what might be necessary for Bethesda Medical Center, which has thousands and thousands of employees and health information all over the place, is going to be entirely different for some small doctor's office in South Georgia somewhere that has three staff members and, and one provider. But no matter how big and small you are, you have to comply with this law. You've got to be proactive. Get your risk assessments completed. It's not a one and done thing. It needs to be done roughly annual. Update those policies. Stay on top of this stuff. Train your staff upon hiring annually. Um, and I can't stress the importance of being proactive with this. And again, there is no perfection. We are, though, required to prove that we are taking reasonable and appropriate steps to secure health information um, to, again, reasonable and appropriate levels. And when you see these gigantic fines, and I'm going to show you some of the most recent fines, the common denominator is a cavalier approach to the law and willful neglect. None of this stuff is rocket science. It really isn't. It's a bunch of common sense. But you've got to go through the procedures. You've got to do those assessments, get this stuff in writing. Very, very important to be proactive, not reactive. That also holds true. God forbid, should legal action be brought against us. And this is happening more and more and more. Last year, was I spent, uh, honestly, probably a third of my time dealing with litigation um, because of, in various states because of violations of one's privacy. So a little bit like the boy who cried wolf historically. When you think the boy screaming wolf, 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 the wolf never shows up, eventually the villagers get desensitized to him screaming wolf. And that's sort of how this law has been because it's been on the books. Government says do this, do that, do this, do that, but they don't enforce or they weren't. Therefore, we become – we've got bigger fish to fry. There's a lot going on running a practice or a business. We've got a lot more – there's other regulations to deal with. But, um, again, the wolf is here. I joke with these pictures, obviously, but I've been doing this a very long time, and it, this HIPAA probably took about 10% of the time of my, my consulting firm back in the old days. Now it takes about 100% of my time, 110%, I should say. There's not really a week that goes by. I don't get a call from some, some uh, attorney asking, did this thing that happened, does it constitute a federal violation? If so, we want to use it under our state law as the foundation of the case against the covered entity or the other side of the coin. Maybe it's the defense calling. I get calls from groups all over the country, uh, covered entities primarily, but some business associates too, wanting to know what do we do because – we're being audited. We've received an audit letter from the Office of Civil Rights for HIPAA. What are we supposed to do about this? So definitely strong bipartisan support for more to be done because data is worth more than oil. Healthcare historically has been a leaking bucket of identity theft, of fraud, of hacking, all sorts of problems because we have not had any real tight regulations. HIPAA is a good being enforced, but it wasn't, like compared to the financial sector, where you've got regulation on top of regulation on top of regulation securing that information. But that's changing because of the, the, the honest, the, the scourge of, of hacking going on and, and uh, from primarily foreign groups against our country wanting data, and data is very valuable. So moving ahead in time, we had the two, 1996 goes law and go, goes into effect. 2003, the security rule comes. 2009, we had something known as the High Tech Act, 
which was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, also known as the Obama Stimulus, where uh, there was a big push to go to electronic health record systems. The federal government would pay you to do it, um, provided we're using it in a, an appropriate way. And, and there was also some additional um, teeth added to the HIPAA security rule, and the pilot audit program began. But then, September 23rd, 2013, that's for all intents and purposes when real, true, proactive enforcement began. That's when the final omnibus rule came out. So prior to that date, we have this poodle. Yes, the poodle did bite some people, just didn't hurt that bad. It could be generally annoying, but by and large, somewhat harmless. Now we have a honey badger. These critters are very proactively aggressive. That's what we have now. We're dealing with a much more aggressive regulation. So let's talk about 923-2013, and then we'll move into some things that, have, that are changing and evolving until, you know, in, into 2019. Now, the final omnibus rule did a few things. Penalties increased. The burden is now equal between business associate and covered entity. That's very, very important for you to understand, especially if you are a business associate. There is a bi-directional responsibility. For example, if you are a, let's say you're a doctor's office and you outsource your medical billing, I'm the billing company, and you're letting me into your system through, say, an unencrypted port open on a firewall, you're giving me one username and password to share amongst my three or four staff members that work your account. That's, there's multiple violations of HIPAA right there. If I accept that access, I am also guilty and complicit in the noncompliance and would be held accountable should breach occur and under various state laws if we were, God forbid, sued because of a breach this way based upon this noncompliant that jeopardized all those folks' information. I have a responsibility to say I cannot work with you if we're not working in a compliant manner. It's always been the other way around. Now it's bi-directional. I've worked a lot of cases where both the business associate and the covered entity get held accountable and get fined and sometimes both get sued for noncompliance and negligence in the way in which they're handling the sensitive information. Um, we'll get more into business associates as we move on. Greatly enforces and increases proactive federal audits. We, these days, we can be audited for no reason. You don't have to have a breach to be audited. You don't have to have a complaint filed to be audited. Now, I will say this, though, and I base this on experience. There's nothing that, that broadcasts this from the federal government, but if you get a, an audit, just say a proactive audit, um, the government's pretty reasonable, and they're, they're, not, they're actually helpful, but when we get an audit, I mean, assuming we have done our due diligence, but when we get an audit based on a complaint or a fairly large breach, it seems as though they're much more aggressive when they audit us and certainly not very helpful, and it's almost as if we're guilty until proven innocent, which isn't really how it's supposed to be, but that's how it seems. But anyway, moving on, uh, more funding, more audits in every single year since 2013, fines have increased. There's been a trajectory upwards every year. Two reasons why. The main reason, the government's enforcing the law. That's number one. But number two, it's that individual remedy. So in 2000, late 2013, the federal government told all 50 attorney generals to implement laws of remedy in your state. And I don't think anyone disagrees that if your health record's been breached due to negligence and it costs you some kind of financial harm or defamation or, or some highly sensitive information got, uh, got exposed, then yeah, you should have a remedy. But we live in America. This is a very litigious country. Um, that means if you, if there's a breach, for example, the, the federal government wanted individuals to have remedy, but if you're going to sue under your state law, they request you file a complaint with them first. We are seeing a mass increase in complaints. 
many of them relatively benign, frivolous. But when we, someone files a complaint, we get investigated. And many times the complaint may be null and void, but when we get investigated, they may find something else. So the complaint didn't happen the way the individual said, but while we're at it, show us proof you've done your risk assessment. Show us proof you've got all this in place. So um, moving on from that, we'll talk more about individual remedy as we move forward. But uh, historically, we know this has been fairly, fairly harmless. No consequences in most cases. Cases for actions, more of a nuisance than a real problem. Fines were low and rare. Audits were very rare. And only the federal government could assess fines on behalf of patients. That's not changing. Federal government still gets paid, but there is that remedy, though, under state law. Audits have begun in earnest. It does not matter your size and scope. Statistically, last year, 2018, um, the smaller medical practices suffered the most in terms of audits, in terms of noncompliance, than did larger hospitals. Business associates also uh, suffered pretty, pretty heavily as well, and, and there's been a big change that's coming down the pipe with business associates we'll talk about um, as we move on here. Personal responsibility. And this is nothing new for 2019, but this is something you, you do need to circle back on and always make sure you train your staff. Everyone needs to be trained upon hire and annually. It's for your own liability. Um, I've worked cases where someone at a, a doctor's office does something really stupid with, with health records. They malicious make a malicious intent, slanderous um, type of disclosure that they had access to of someone they didn't like. Like one particular case, the uh, young lady worked at the practice and then her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend was a patient and she didn't like that person, went in that health record and made some malicious disclosures both on Facebook and through um, and verbally. And she went to jail that right, she was federally prosecuted in the Department of Justice. And then there's been other cases um, with this. It is a serious consequence. That is a civil right everyone has. But our responsibility as a practice or a business is to make sure our staff members are trained formally to know this, that they sign off on confidentiality agreements. They're trained upon hire, trained annually. You have policies in place for sanctions. You have audit controls where you can look at what people are doing within your electronic health record system. Because if we don't, and a staff member does something really stupid, yeah, they're going to get in trouble. But then we can end up getting sued and held accountable by the federal government for what they did. So very important to understand that concept. <clears throat> now, it's not just about securing health information. Of course, patients have a civil right of security to their health record. They also have a civil right of access. So if I come in the practice and say, I want my health record, and you say no because you owe us money, that's a HIPAA violation. If I come in the practice and say, hey, I want my health record, and you say no because half of this record was created by another doctor's office not affiliated with us, doesn't matter. It's my record. We are custodians of the record. We, as in a medical practice, patients have a civil right of access even in a disaster. That's why disaster recovery is required under HIPAA. So <clears throat> let's say you lost your, your, your system fried, your server just died, completely zapped, and your backups were no good, therefore you've lost all this information. Well, that's not a breach, but that is a major HIPAA violation. Now let's talk about business associates a minute because there's been quite a bit of uh, quite a bit going on here that, that began last year. Um, but just by definition, and I don't know who all on this webinar is a covered entity or a business associate, but there are seven times more business associates in the United States than there are covered entities. Now, these are those third parties, individuals or entities that create, receive, maintain, or store health information on behalf of a covered entity. Answering services, medical transcription, IT groups, billing companies, shredding services, Many times attorney's offices could be, um, a collection agency could be, even gigantic groups like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, they would be considered a business associate if they're maintaining protected health information in their systems, which they certainly are. Um, and then 
very, very small little one-person businesses that may be developing an app, they would be, their business anyway, would be considered a, quote, business associate. Now, <clears throat> so these days, 